Thank you, Naveen. Uh, I'm just going to start by um, encouraging anyone who hasn't uh, looked at the art exhibit by Jarnel Singh. It's really something. To, he's put a human face on the Komagata Maru, uh, you know, uh, exclusion of the ship coming, and, and I, I've been reading about this and reading about the history. And this provided me with another, uh, you know, just putting a face to Gurdit Singh, to Bog Singh, to Miwa Singh, to William Hopkinson, and, you know, what happened when they went back to Calcutta. And it was a very um, uh, moving experience for me as somebody who's been familiar with this story for a long time to see it in art. was. Uh, so I'm going to be writing something up on our website when I get back about your work. So thank you for doing that. And I want to thank you, Cecilia for just a wonderful speech. And um, I've been asked uh, by Gurpreet to bring together kind of some of the parallels between the South Asian struggle in British Columbia and the First Nations. Uh, I'm not a historian, and I must admit I'm a little nervous with Naveen here, so I encourage <laughs> Naveen to correct me if I make any errors. And the same uh, I would extend to you, Cecilia. Um, but I, but I am keenly interested in it because I think what uh, we went through was a long period of white supremacy in Canada and I don't think we've fully acknowledged that and all that has flowed from that and how it's um, affecting us to this day. So um, as many of you know, Gurpreet is a good friend of mine and he's been contributing uh, columns to our website and to our paper for many years and uh, that's in addition to his work as a radio host which I'm sure many of you are aware of um, and I see all of these activities as well as the calendars that he does with the uh, Indo-Canadian Workers Association and the representatives are here uh, as well as Radio India it's it's part of a, a broad effort that he's making that is, you know, it's, it's integrated into his life in terms of educating us uh, about our history and, and bringing us um, together as a country. And, and so what I've found interesting, observing Gurpreet, how he was affected by the Idle No More movement and, and seeing the parallels and this was, was something I had never considered, between the gutter movement struggle, which uh, we're celebrating the centenary of this year, and, and what was happening with the young people and the First Nations. So he's had me thinking a lot about this. And his uh, new book, um, one of the things uh, he included, which I wasn't aware of um, until he submitted it as a column, was the, the first... Um, uh, Punjabi paper outside of India was published in Canada in, in 1910. And, and then he also, he did a column about the 100 year anniversary of the Gutter Party, and as many of you know, but maybe some of you don't, this was a group of uh, uh, people of South Asian descent here in BC and along the west coast of North America who formed a party and Gutter from, if I can believe what Gurpreet's saying, it is mutiny in Urdu, um, and, and that it was taking the struggle to India. And so, and this was not happening in a, in a disconnected way. There was a whole historical uh, series event, of events that was going on. And uh, one of the things that uh, has been pointed out to me uh, by Sohan, uh, I don't know if he, is Sohan here? The, um, but he, uh, Sohan Singh Puni uh, was telling me that the actual, the continuous migration legislation, which was crafted to stop people of South Asian descent from coming here, was, there was, it was actually worked on um, with Britain. So the federal government of Canada was working with Britain to bring in this continuous migration legislation in 1908, which had the effect of stopping people coming here from India. And so, and why would Britain want to do that? Well, part of the problem was the Indians here had a lot more freedom than the Indians in India. And this was, had the potential to create problems for the British Empire in India, because if the Indians in India started saying, well, how come these Indians who are also in the British Empire, that they can vote, they can do these things? So a bunch of things started happening. So you had the vote taken away in 1907, you had the continuous migration legislation in 1908. You also had um, 
some other things happening on the side, which included the, um, the riots in Chinatown and Japantown in 1907. In 1908, you also had, uh, with Japanese immigration to BC, where the liberal government of the era uh, actually negotiated with the government of Japan to limit immigration to 1,000 people per year. So, so basically, we had efforts in Canada to stop people coming from Asia. So there was the continuous migration legislation for the people uh, from India. There was the, the cap on immigration from Japan. But the problem with China was the government was so weak that what um, that that Canada couldn't negotiate with the Chinese government because there had been the Boxer Rebellion. So then they just put a tax, and it started at fifty dollars in 1885, uh, which was, I think, no coincidence when the railway was finished. Went up to a hundred dollars in in 1900. It went up to nine, uh, five hundred dollars in 1903, and then in 19, 1923 they passed legislation basically banning Chinese immigration. So we really had a lot of things happening to the Chinese, to the uh, Indians, and also to the Japanese. And then later with the Japanese, there was the what happened in 1941-42 uh, with the the. Uh, internment where they were taken and put in concentration camps and their assets were seized and sold off. So, so this, this was a, a, a very um, depressing chapter. But what was also happening um, to the First Nations is there was a, a, a man named Duncan, Duncan Campbell Scott who was just, uh, who was kind of driving the federal policy with, with First Nations people and basically it was, it was a, a, a campaign of extermination, at least culturally, by taking the kids from the schools, from their homes, putting them in residential schools, and um, prohibiting them from speaking their languages, and basically trying to turn them into into fine British subjects. And um, and so, and then when there was resistance, there were all sorts of things that happened. Um, so the First Nations were also under siege. And one of the things I appreciate about the work Naveen has been doing, as well as other people, has been showing how sometimes these people who were facing oppression actually worked together. And so you had the, the Chinese and the First Nations, and the Musqueam in particular with the Grant family, and that there's, there is a real history of connectivity there. That because they were wiped out of the history books, because people of color were not allowed to be in the professions, they weren't allowed to be politicians, they uh, were basically marginalized, that this is not known to the, the, the general public to the degree. So that's why I really appreciate seeing, you know, a Musqueam presentation to open an event for a, an immigrant from India who's written about historical oppression in Canada. And I think that type of activity was actually happening a long time ago. And there's, there are people who've been working to bring attention to this. And, and uh, Hugh Johnston, an historian, uh, wrote, uh, has written extensively about the Komagata Maru. There's uh, uh, Sohan Puni, who I've mentioned. I see Pervez Summer in the back with her students and what she's doing in terms of educating people about this uh, history um, although I think you're at film school now, right? But you'll be back. But, but Pervez was teaching at, at Kwantlen. Um, you've got the work of Naveen. You've got the work of Gurpreet. Um, so I, I see an awakening taking place. And also with Harsha Walia. I see you in the back, Harsha. And the work you've been doing with First Nations has been quite extraordinary and impressive and, and hard job. So, so we see this integration and this connection um, still happening to this day. And, and I think it's important to let the young people know about these Canadian stories, which, as you've mentioned, was, were, are not, were not taught in school. And I know they weren't taught in school because I was teaching at Kwantlen, teaching journalism, and trying to get the young reporters ready to be journalists, and I was stunned how little they knew. They didn't know about Komagata Maru. They didn't know about the Japanese internment. They knew very little about the head tax. Um, and, it, and it really made me question what, what was happening in the schools uh, in that period. That was 1998 to 2005, so I can't speak necessarily of what's happening now. There may have been some changes. 
but but I was quite distressed that um, that these things were not known, and to see people like Summer, like Gurpreet, like Naveen, trying to fill that gap, I think uh, what they're doing is that this is engaging young people's curiosity. It's possibly leading them, you know, to an interest in a life of scholarship, but most importantly, reducing the sense of alienation that comes from feeling that you don't belong. And let's not kid ourselves. Alienation is one of the reasons kids end up in gangs and engage in criminal activity if they don't feel a sense of connectivity. And um, alienation leads people to not want to vote, not to engage in the community. And there's research from polling organizations that show that people of color who are born in Canada, I haven't seen it recently, but this was, I've read it in the past, are less likely to vote. Um, and by countering this alienation and helping people achieve a sense of rootedness, um, Gurpreet and the others are, are, I think, providing a very valuable service. So this book that you've written is helping to connect people to their past and to their roots, and I think that's extremely important. I think we're seeing it with the Idle No More movement as well, um, where you can see these young people just coming alive and feeling a sense of connection and feeling that I can make a difference. That is really exciting to see. I saw a young woman on the stage of the art gallery, and she was buoyant as she was uh, speaking, and, and she says, we survived genocide. And it was like, we can do anything. And, and I just, it was so exciting to see. And, and so I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about where things are going from here. But I think it, it takes hard work and dedication. And I applaud all of you for having the curiosity to come out and hear and, you know, listen to someone like me <laughs> prattle on for a few minutes. Um, but I, I, I would encourage you to um, think about that and the importance of that sense of connection to our past. So this is why I think the work that Gurpreet's doing is very important because I think it, it, it is without that connection, without that understanding, it breeds alienation and, and alienation brings all sorts of other, other problems with it. So, I think I'll close with that and pass the microphone on to Naveen.